CB8 Speaks. I'm Jane Parshall, a longtime member of Community Board 8. We are so happy that we have this program, CB8 Speaks, so that the public can learn more about how community boards work, what they stand for. One interest that I have is historic preservation and concurrent with that, zoning issues. We are very lucky tonight to have as our guest Elizabeth Ashby, one of the giants of both historic preservation and zoning on the Upper East Side, many different neighborhoods, but most especially her relationship with Carnegie Hill, where she lives in one of the, uh, in an apartment building designed by one of the great designers from the mid-century, Rosario Candela. I'm going to ask Elizabeth first to tell us a little bit about herself. Elizabeth, can you tell us something about yourself, your history, how you got to Community Board 8? Yeah. Well, it was sort of fortuitous because I moved into uh, my apartment in 1979 uh, not having lived in my own country as an adult. I living, was living in England. And so I came back. I knew nothing about anything, whatever went, you know, community boards and so on. And I'd been there about two, three or four months when my block, block had a block association meeting. And I thought, well, of course, one or to be supportive, I would go to the meeting. So I went, and um, somebody wanted to be president, and then they said, well, who will be vice president? And uh, nobody spoke up. And one of my neighbors said, well, can you do it? So I, I said, all right, I'll do that, uh, and signed up. So it, it wasn't that I won a challenging election, uh, you know, I was, I filled in. And I hadn't been involved with the Block Association for very long before a charming small uh, house on the south side of uh, 96th Street was sold to a developer who wanted to take it down and build this tall, skinny tower just on the site of the uh, little house. So I thought, well, that can't be legal. That can't be done. Uh, you know, what do we do about it? And somebody said, well, you can go to the community board and see if they'll help. And of course, I'd never heard of a community board, but I showed up and I there's the public session. So I said, that this was all going up and what can we do about it? And uh, they tell me it's not legal, uh, not illegal. And so I, I said, well, there should be a law. And they said, okay, propose one. So that was how I got my start was, I went home and proposed it and uh, worked on it uh, for a long time. Uh, and uh, the community board was very helpful, and I worked with city planning, and after a while, uh, there was the neighborhood group that, of course, I hadn't heard of either, called Carnegie Hill Neighbors that had been dormant for about five years, and uh, with, I guess because of the work I was doing on the Sliver Law, they asked uh, me to take it over and restart it. So I did that. So that was how I kind of uh, got involved really with zoning, uh, of course, which of course I'd never heard of before. And then a beautiful Ogden Codman Jr. house that was used as a convent for the Church of St. Francis de Sales was up for sale. They decided to sell it and we were afraid it'll be torn down too. So then I found out that there was a Landmarks Preservation Commission and we asked that it be 
designated, and it had the, designated. What do you mean it, by designated? Uh, it's designated a landmark, and it's protected, and it's reviewed by the commission if they want to make a change. So, uh, and when the commission had designated Codman's own house, which is also on 96th Street, they didn't do the convent because the church ob uh, objected anyway. So we went to work on that. And then the president of the 95th Street Block Association was having problems. So she said, there's a thing called a historic district, Carnegie Hill Historic District. So then I found out that it was that. And uh, we decided to ask that the his little tiny little patches of historic district uh, that they be extended up to 96th Street. They went only to 94th Street. So that was when we started working on extending the, his the Carnegie Hill Historic District. So that, in my total ignorance, uh, was how I kind of got started with both things. Well, so interesting. You were in the right place at the right time and ready to be a volunteer. So important to all of our civic organizations, volunteer work. Yeah. Now tell me, extending the Carnegie Hill Historic District, what's involved? How does a historic district even happen? Well, it happened before I was living in this country, so I can't really tell you how this one did. But they start when you, uh, either the commission decides that that group of buildings should be a historic district, it has a character that should be, or that the people there, which uh, I found the, the original president of Carnegie Hill Neighbors proposed these two little patches. Right. And uh, so... But you ha if you do decide to go to the commission and extend the district boundaries, you have to do research, don't you, on each building within? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's what I wanted you to speak a little bit about, because each building yeah, well, has we, a write-up. Yes, the commission does the write-up. You, uh, you do the research on who built it, when. Uh, uh, right, the, the, the background. Ba yeah, the background. And... We were doing that on the two blocks and Harriet Bachman and she was kind of organizing that. We had someone taking pictures. And then when we got far enough and I was running Carnegie Hill Neighbors, the commission said, well, you know, why not do the whole area? So we did that. So that was actually the commission's initiative to they, make it even the, bigger making than what it, you had it, thought of originally. The, yes. And so uh, we we had volunteers who went down to the, de to the Department of Buildings. That's where that information is, when it was built, who built it, who owned right. it, and so on. And um, so, and we had a very good photographer uh, volunteer, but he was a professional photographer. So he did the the photographs of, of all the buildings with an assistant we found because if you're photographing buildings, people are apt to step back and get run over. So <laughs> um, we had a photographer and a photographer's assistant doing that. So, wow. And we did all that work and we waited and we took 13 years to get from the beginning proposal to the end to get it designated. Well, I think that's something the public is just totally unaware of, especially the public who lives within a historic district. They have no idea the work involved and the time it takes. And 13 years is a long, long time. I know the um, Park Avenue Historic District recently established, that took 10 years. Yeah. So it's oh, amazing. Speedy. <laughs> yeah, not speedy at all, but at least it happened. And of course, these historic neighborhoods, the designated historic districts are what make the East Side so wonderful and so livable. Now, that's historic preservation. The Sliver Building was zoning. Yeah. So one aspect of your life is you've been involved with the City Planning Commission and the other aspect has been the Landmarks Preservation Commission. 
So those yeah. two agencies are really responsible for how we live, the zoning and yeah. the historic district boundaries. We had a very interesting fight on the Upper East Side about, gosh, now over 20 years ago, the city neighbors fight over the single site Citibank building at 91st and Madison. Can you tell us about the role you played in that? I know at that time you were the chair of the Landmarks Committee for Community Board 8, but then you had to step aside because you were so involved with the actual neighborhood fight. Yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, th that fight was, uh, people were astounded. It wasn't a great little building, but what people like uh, prefer is lower buildings. Yes. Uh, and find these tall towers. So it was a very tall tower that was proposed there. And the neighborhood got it uh, organized. You were very much involved with that. Uh, and I think we just pressed our case and we didn't protect the, preserve the building, but we got a much better, much lower buildings, you know, simply by going down and, uh, and testifying against Endlessly, it. it seemed. Jennifer Rabb was the chairperson of the commission. And I think we went down there for hearings like three or four times, and we'd get busloads of people to come with us. It was an incredible neighborhood fight and one that I think had a lot of panache because of the leadership. You and your dear friend, Terry Slater, who was a very active in historic yeah. preservation and the co-chair of the Landmarks Committee of Community Board 8 with you, yeah, who really played such a strong role. She was on the board of the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. And then after that, the two of you started the Defenders of the Upper East Side. Well, that Tell was, us about that and how that happened. Oh, that was uh, uh, much, much, much later. That was in uh, nearly 2000. And, and we started it. Uh, but that wasn't much later because the city neighbors fight really started at the end of 1998 and lasted to maybe 2004. So right sort of in the middle, the defenders came along. Yeah, well, what we started, uh, which I had been working on, uh, was the landscape of historic districts. And we, we were installing uh, the Bishop's Crook street lights. Yes. And Department of Transportation installed them. They had a program where if you donated them, they would install them. So uh, we did that on quite a lot of streets in, down in the Treadwell Farm Historic District, so on. And then Department of Transportation stopped installing them if you did it. You could install them yourself, but we would not be in a position if something went wrong with it of repairing it. Because the, if something goes wrong with the street lights, uh, the installer says it's Con Edison, Con Edison says it's the installer, and Department of Transportation is in a position to argue that one out. But we're not in a position to do it. Yeah. So, and, and all the politicians very kindly wrote a letter for us explaining. But when you say for us, is that for defenders or was no, it? No, it was started, it was called the Historic Neighborhood Enhancement Alliance. Okay. And the politicians wrote to the Department of Transportation and explained the problem they had and asked them to start the thing. And they never did again. So we, we waited. And then so many terrible proposals were coming forward, you know, uh, to take down good buildings, to build these towers and so on, uh, that people asked us, well, to, to help them with their local programs, you know, the opposition. And so we extended 
uh, the Historic Neighborhood Enhancement Alliance to include a, a section that we call Defenders of the Historic Upper East Side, and we partner with we're, with uh, all these uh, ad hoc groups. And so we're, you know, of course, we're tax deductible, so they they don't have to s start from scratch. We're there right. and we help them. So that's what we did. Very interesting, Elizabeth, because I know that. Defenders continues to play a role in trying to make these neighborhoods aware of the issues they're facing. You do your monthly mailings mm -hmm. and talk about the applications that are before the commission that relate to. So that people know what's coming yes, exactly. down the pike. Yeah. And then you also have field trips to some of yeah. the historic well, we, properties, the historic houses trust properties. Mm -hmm. The Morris Jamel Mansion, for example, yeah. or the Van Cortland House, where you sort of tie in a fun activity that I guess is a fun, little tiny bit of a fundraiser for you. Yeah, actually, it's not. We subsidize. Oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very generous of you. Yeah. Anyway, but... so these things are so important. Well, how did you get to be co-chair of Landmarks? You know, when I first joined the board, which was a long time ago, 1988, um, Alice Sachs was the chair of the Landmarks Committee. Then I rotated off the board for a while, and I didn't go back for maybe 15, 20 years. Yeah. But um, how did you become co-chair of Landmarks? Well, I, I guess because I was so active in historic preservation uh, and... Uh, Terry Slater was co-chair, and her chair co-chair had moved back to wherever, whatever country she came from. And Carolyn Greenberg was chair of the board, and she asked me, and Terry wanted me to be chair. So, really, that was how how I got to be co-chair. Yeah. Well, I remember those days so so well, and it's true. The chair of the board appoints the co-chairs of all the committees or mm -hmm. the chairs of all the committees. And I felt very privileged to be even ask myself to be um, co-chair of Landmarks after Susan Leck died. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. David Liston was the, our, the chair of the board at that time. So that's so interesting about Defenders. I get all your mailings and I always read them avidly and always wish that I could go on some of your trips to these very yeah, interesting well, they, properties. Yeah. The uh, virus did us in from that one, yeah. so we haven't been on any for, uh, uh, oh, I think three years now. Well, maybe you'll start up again now that yeah. things are much more <laughs> open and everything. Well, there have been um, so many exciting things that happen on the Upper East Side. Carnegie Hill Neighbors does play an important advocacy role for that community. We have friends farther south. Do you work with friends at all? I know you work with Carnegie Hill Neighbors. I did it for, I think, about 14 or 15 years. And if something in common comes up, you yeah. know, we talk. Uh, you know, we but, then, but, but I've not been involved with it at all. Gotcha. Tell me, the City Planning Commission, do you think they do a good job, the Department of City Planning, in protecting our neighborhoods through zoning? Or are there challenges to the zoning? I know we're always hearing about challenges to the mid-block zoning. Yeah. R8B, the low in scale. Yeah. What is the height limit for the R8B? I think it's 60. 60 feet. It may be 75. But I, I think city planning is the source of all the good zoning that uh, we have on the Upper East Side. Every bit of the Upper East Side has either a special zoning district or contextual zoning uh, that is zoning requires buildings that respect the context. And that was why R8B, which is on the mid blocks, uh, that was designated on the Upper West Side first. And, uh, I went down, and I'm sure a lot of other people went down from the east side and said, yes, this is wonderful. We want some, too. 
And so. And what year was that, would you say? I, mid 80s. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the commission studied all that, and the commission gave us all of, of R8B. And then on the wide streets, which used to have no height limit, we got contextual zone, which is called R10A, which is a height limit of 210 feet. And Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue are the special park improvement districts, which was, this happened before I was living here, but this was called the special park improvement district because you paid for something and it's supposed to raise money for the parks. Gosh. Well, the money got lost, nothing ever happened. So they continued it and contextual zone for Park Avenue and Fifth Avenue, which are a limit of 210 feet. And so everything except they've got a patch that's left out, a very large patch, which is First, Second, Third New York Avenues, which have no protective zoning. So those buildings, those big, tall apartment buildings we see are all built as of right that there's no limit on the height. Yeah. But isn't there an initiative through the community board, the zoning committee, yes. to what, try to, could you explain a little bit about well, that? Yes, we have a proposal. Uh, we were getting complaints. We had zoning committee meetings sometimes of 300 people come in and complain about all these tall buildings and what can we do about it. And, uh, there was nothing under the current law. They were perfectly... So Ben Kalos, who was then the councilman in that area, gave us money for a planner to do some work on it. And we discussed it with him. And we figured that the best solution was special zoning districts, which gives you the power. And we proposed the southern half which is the Lenox Hill and the Northern Half, uh, which is the Yorkville Special Districts. Um, and they do three absolutely essential things, I believe, for the character of the community and the quality of life who live there. We have a height limit of 210 feet, which is the prevailing height limit. Right, and that, the prevailing height limit on Madison and yeah. on Lexington and on Park. Yeah, and on the broad sides, a broad oh. cross town oh, streets so 79th too. So Street, it's really, and Street. on East End Avenue. So it's really the, and the only exception is Lexington, which is narrower because mm -hmm. it's, it has a lower height limit because it's just an R nine X, which is um, because it's a narrower street. So the exception isn't bigger; the exception is lower. Interesting. And so we have that height limit, which is respecting the rest of the Upper East Side. We protect the tenements and low buildings, which uh, protects affordable housing. And uh, I think that there is enormous move to build affordable housing, which I support entirely. But I think even best is protecting the existing affordable housing because you protect people's housing and people's homes. And the third component is we protect local re retail and service stores. And so we've had that proposal and we refiled the pre-application last spring and we're waiting uh, to hear back from uh, city plan. Well, does city planning assign specific people to work with you, or is it more sort of who's ever inbox it lands in? Or Usually it has been the Manhattan office, and it's a certification process, uh, and they decide what else they need to do to do it, and you do f see if you need environmental review. I hope we don't because it's not going to create any more shadows. It's, right. it's not taller. It doesn't 
what's called the FAO, or the floor area ratio, which is the number of times you multiply this square footage of your lot to get the permissible square footage of your building so that the density is not affected, so there are not going to be more people because of this proposal. So I, I, I hope that they don't find anything to require an environmental impact statement. But whatever it is, then you go on, and then you go, then the commissioners vote on it down the line. When the commissioners finish, then it goes to the city council, goes to the mayor, and he can veto it, and then the city council can override the veto. And uh, Well, we used to always think that there were no, um, that the, the city council respected the members who were presented the communities. I'm thinking of the blood center, yeah. where and all our elected officials were really. basically opposed to the blood center. And yet, when it got to the vote in the city council, instead of having that deferral yeah. to the locally elected officials, that sort of got thrown member out. Member preference. The yes, thank you. Member preference. Exactly. Yes, that got sort of thrown out the window. It was, and uh, that was a terrible proposal. The, the idea of a life science building is not a bad proposal. It's just a bad proposal there. It was in R8B, yeah. which is a, you know, t a, a the mid great block. big tower. And that's a residential area. It's a commercial tower. Which um, reminds me to speak a bit about community facilities, because they're excluded, aren't they, under the zoning? For instance, R8B, and you want to put in... A, a, you know, do something. Yeah, to, well, as yes, a, a lot of facility. residential areas uh, have an exception for really institutions. They're called community facilities. Uh, anything. So from Lenox hospital Hill Hospital is is excluded because it's considered a community facility, and that's how they were going to be able or are going to build their great big tower no. on Lexington. No. No, because the tower is not a community facility. The tower is commercial. They they changed. They didn't vary the law. They threw the law out and changed it so that it is permitted. Oh, interesting. I didn't realize that. That's so interesting to me. Well, I don't know. I think that we live in such a wonderful city. I've been fascinated to see the life on the streets again now that the pandemic is over. I love going into the park. It's just such an amazing place. What are your thoughts? You've lived here for a long time now. What are your thoughts about the future for New York, especially for our neighborhoods? Well, I think the community has to be more involved I think it, not only is that good government, that makes people who are involved make better citizens than uh, people who don't care. And I think it makes for a better community and so on. And I think that there is an unfortunate move uh, politically, not our local official, uh, elected officials, but the wider city to remove the community from the process. Uh, the, there's a move to take uh, the community and the community board out of the, what we call it ULERP to be, but the Uniform Land Use Review Process. So instead of having a community involvement in the development of uh, zoning and special districts and responding to requests for variances, which very important to have the community involved to get a better thing. I think also the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, now uh, is giving a great deal more for st uh, uh, staff approval as opposed to uh, going to the commission. Yes, and, that is a somewhat disturbing trend, which I've noticed myself. It's just horrifying. I think you're right, though, that there is a movement 
sort of at the top levels of government with our among, you know, I guess you would call our current administration running the city to sort of delete us, the little people, from the process. And yet how sad it would be if there was no forum for the public to go and speak, because I certainly know for these zoning issues, which go to our land use committee and for landmarks issues, which come to the landmarks committee, it's really the first step in the public approval process and gives the public a chance to have their say and to give their opinion and to try to influence the direction that the commission might go in for a certain application or for a zoning variance. Yeah, and I think that another thing, it really is necessary uh, to protect the process. I can remember years ago, um, we had an application um, from a a landmark uh, that wanted to do something at the rear facade. And um, at one of our uh, discussions, uh, uh, somebody from the neighboring building, they were proposing something for the rear facade, uh, said, well, you know, they've taken down that section. Well, no one would know that. You don't know what somebody's taken down, but... uh, the people next door know that they've done done something, which actually was quite illegal. Uh, but no one would have known it ha- had not the public been involved and provided that information. Well, I think that's very true. And we saw that certainly in the Treadwell Farms Historic District, 210 East 62nd mm-hmm. Street, the public brought it to our attention about what was going on, on that at that house and how there had been violations from what was originally approved by the commission. So all these things are so interesting and evolving in our great city. Well, we so appreciate you taking the time to come here, Elizabeth. We need to have some historical memory of your involvement for the future for sort of an archival history And you certainly have played this incredible role on the community board for all of these many years, certainly since I've been on it. And you've really been our conscience on the zoning, the attempts to try to change R8B, which sometimes do slip through, you know. that. Yes, that was with the blood center was a disgrace. Well, and I also think of others. 3 East 89th Street, the art gallery that's there yeah. now, how they pierced the zoning by adding the glass block, and the commission allowed that glass box, box at yeah. the rooftop. So it's an evolving city. We're evolving to us members of the community board, and we so appreciate the opportunity to have this interview with you, and hopefully we'll be able to meet again and explore in further depth both zoning and historic preservation as they relate to the Upper East Side. So thank you so much for coming. And to all of our viewers out there, I hope you learned something from this episode of CB8 Speaks. Thank you so much. Your father was a brain surgeon.